It's finally the day where we start on siding. Our zip system sheathing has been doing the job of keeping us dry for, oh, we started in around right July of 22. It's now May of 23. So we're come, we're about 10 months, almost 11 months in on the zip. It's only warranty to six months, so we're well past that, but it looks the same as it does as the day it was installed. So shout out to Huber for making a great product and keeping our walls dry. But now it is finally time for exterior cladding. We've put it off to get our mechanical penetrations through. We're still not fully done with that, but we have a good idea where everything's gonna be now. And so we're confident we can put siding on. Our project has four different types of exterior claddings on it. James Hardy siding, stone veneer, PVC sheet, board and batten, and then regular vinyl. They all have different reasons why we chose them. This video though is gonna focus on Hardy. We can see behind me is our Benjamin Oblex Slicker Max rain screen. We have a whole separate video on this, but this material will be underlying all the exterior claddings, including the vinyl, including the stone veneer. This is a rain screen system, and it is the secret to a long lasting exterior cladding. We're gonna be getting some help with the signing install from my neighbor Ben and his helper Mike. They're the same guys who did our soft and fascia, which they did a fantastic job on. The main reason that I'm bringing in help for siding is because of the heights. They have the right equipment to get to the top of these 26 foot tall gable walls, which are pump jack scaffolds. I personally don't own these. They're a very expensive piece of equipment, but one that's really necessary in doing an efficient, safe and quality siding job. Before we get started, let's go over some of my trim details because it's gonna be kind of unique compared to what you typically see with these installs. I did not want to use any exterior sealants if possible. So that is actually not what James Hardy recommends. They recommend caulking where siding butts up to um, all the sides of any sort of block out or flashing. But I actually bent up my own metal J channel out of coil stock here from McElroy. This is a one inch deep J channel to accommodate my quarter inch thick rain screen, plus my Hardy, which when lapped comes out to about three quarter inch thick. So one inch deep J. And then I have metal head flashing pretty much everywhere over top of that. So I also bent that up just out of flat cheat stock. Where my Hardy meets the doors, windows, corners, etc., my detail is gonna be even a little bit different yet. I have essentially what I call a sub trim or um, I don't know, a furring strip, I guess you could call it, but it is PVC. To save some money, I used five quarter deck board pressure treated on the corners. The idea at these transitions are we're gonna apply the siding. This is spaced one inch off my sheathing to again accommodate my quarter inch slicker max plus the stack up of the siding, which at the thickest comes out to an inch. And then I'm going to basically put the real decorative trim over and that's why I have these big ugly deck screws in here because it's gonna be covered. And then we'll use the expensive screws to fasten a piece of one by six over this. So this surround will go all the way around the door and we'll be fastening this with Cortex screws made by Fasten Master. They are a very, very expensive fastener that the screw countersinks itself and then they provide you a white plug that plugs that screw head. And when you stand back, you cannot see where the fasteners are. This eliminates the small little trim nail holes, which again, I'm also not a big fan of. I know these are popular for fastening PVC trim. Don't like the look of them, but yeah, these trim nail holes and then, or just regular screws or even, they make pretty low profile, I guess, finish, trim screws, I guess, that we could have used, but uh, leaves a hole similar to this nail head, and I didn't really want to go for that. It's not super easy to fill the nail holes on this PVC trim, as far as I'm aware. I don't know what products do that the best. So to avoid that, I'm just going with the Cortex screw route. Here's the detail at the tops of the openings. We have our one by four surround, and this is actually shimmed off a quarter inch because this metal flashing right here, the hem and the fastener on, I basically added up to a quarter inch. So to keep this thing flush, we decided to use uh, just a shim to shim that out. If it were totally flat and we did this around other areas where we didn't have this, we just used a five quarter board so it was actually one inch thick. But the top of this will receive a five quarter by six piece of trim as well. And here's an oversight that I have to correct before the guys get here. I'm gonna put a piece of head flashing above this so there would be a bent piece of metal coming down on the wall and then over here. But then I didn't realize how big of a gap was gonna be back here and so uh, you're gonna be able to see that from the side. I'm gonna have to rip a board that can basically span the width of this. It's, about, it's gonna be about another one by four and place that in here just to fill that gap and give this header trim a little bit more backing for fasteners. Here's a piece of our head flashing. I couldn't hold two with one hand, but it's gonna come out about halfway over top of our little top cap. 
I forgot to mention, this is a one by two top cap where we actually ripped a five degree angle on the top of the one by and a matching on the back of this top cap so that it's flat. And that will basically give us another little drip cap. So our flashing is gonna come probably midway or a little bit more than midway onto this cap here. The last detail you may have noticed is that I routed little half inch by uh, probably quarter inch deep relief holes uh, on the back of this, just in case there's any incidental moisture that gets behind the trim, it has just a little bit of airspace to dry out. It's just a minor detail. I wasn't sure how necessary this was, maybe not at all, but I thought I was here, so I might as well do it. The bottom of it will be exposed, but that's why I did nice clean holes so it won't be too unsightly. Up on the top window trims, I actually did it on both the front and the back because driving rain will be hitting that window and coming down as well as out of those two little weep holes there. That's if any water gets into the sill, that's how they get out. So I thought this would integrate well with the rain screen because our rain screen will come right beneath that. So if any water comes down off that window, it will drip down and right behind that trim into our rain screen. We can then follow that all the way down through the channels and boom, it hits flashing and gets kicked out onto the ground. When the guys arrived, the first step was to set the pump jacks up. The top of wall detail for the Hardy allowed us to easily fasten them to the wall. Usually they'll go under a shingle on a shingled roof, but that was not an option with our finished metal roof and soffit and fascia. After getting the pump jack set up, the first step was to get another course of Slicker Max on, put the metal flashing over the garage door, and then we were ready to set the first course of siding. To get this first course straight, my rotary laser came in handy once again. I marked a level line across the whole side, then we measured up to get a chalk line at the top edge of that first course. So the first step in our hardy siding after we have a rain screen on is putting on a starter strip. This little inch and a quarter ripped strip, we just ripped it out of a piece of siding, helps keep that first course of siding at the right angle relative to the wall. If we didn't have this, that first course would just be sitting flat and that doesn't do great for dripping water off of. So this starter strip will start it at the right pitch and then every siding course thereafter will sit on that previous course and they'll be all at the same angle. I bought a fiber cement blade for my circular saw and the guy started setting up a cutting jig to use that. But we found pretty quickly for the smoothest and most consistent cuts, a four inch diamond blade on a cordless angle grinder was really the way to go for cutting this stuff. This method does create a bunch of silica dust, which is not ideal, but it doesn't throw chips back in your face like the fiber cement blade does. And overall, it's just the most versatile and easiest to use tool. They do make shears to cut fiber cement, which personally I've never used, but I can't imagine they leave that clean of a cut when you're trying to do really detailed work and cut around boxes. Regardless, I didn't really want to invest in a set for just one job. Maybe they work better than I'm imagining, but the angle grinder got the job done for us. All right, we're three courses in now, and let me just run you through a couple of the installation details that we're kind of figuring out. We strategically picked the side of the house that will be least visible in order to kind of figure out our learning curve. There's gonna be a learning curve with any real new installation on a custom build. So we wanted to get our nail depth set correctly. It's a new siding gun that I bought. Um, you know, so there's just some nuances we had to figure out, but our exposure on the siding is seven inch. These are eight and a quarter inch panels. So there's inch and a quarter overlap. James Hardy has this nail line imprinted in it. So we're shooting to hit the nail line with each fastener. I'm using two inch long stainless steel nails. I believe the diameter is 0.090. Uh, they're a typical full round head siding nail and we're shooting them in so that they the goal is to get them pretty much flush with the material it can be a little bit difficult when you're starting out because you're trying to figure out air pressure and gun depth but the gun we have you can regulate the depth of the nail head so i think we've pretty much got it down where two butt joints meet in the middle of the wall we're putting some just it's a this is a 10 by 6 piece of sheet metal that we cut out and we're you know, centering it roughly between the joints, holding it up about a quarter inch from the bottom edge. This is so that any driving rain that might work its way in this crack here, hits something else and then laps and comes down over the next course of siding. It's just another good best practice. It's, uh, I think it's specced by James Hardy and actually I think it's required by building code as well with lap siding. We still have our rain screen behind here. So honestly, even if there is moisture that somehow makes behind the siding, whether through rain or condensation, we're protected with the rain screen. This is a pretty neat tool that we're using. It's called a gecko gauge. Essentially, it's just a block that it's got a little foot that can slide up underneath the previous course. And then this handle puts a little bit of pressure on this little rubber strip in here and it grips onto the siding. It's adjustable with these bolts so you can adjust your exposure, but the next course of siding will then sit right on top of this. So it's really easy to set your first course of siding level and then every course thereafter remains level because of these gecko gauges. So definitely a must have tool if you're doing lap siding.
Ben and Mike hit the road. It's noon on Memorial Day, so it was time for a cookout, but we got quite a bit of progress done and got some of the kinks worked out in just the few hours that we worked this morning. The pump jacks are set up and we're at a great spot to hit the ground running tomorrow. And it's time for an inaugural Memorial Day cookout with our new camper as well. Thanks to my mom for making some burgers. This is awesome. Got the, we're, we're really christening the picnic table with the camper. I love it. If this isn't Memorial Day in a nutshell, I don't know what is. Then she went outside. You looking for a treat? She normal, he normally looking for a treat? Ooh, ooh. Sit. Get down. Sit. Good boy. Good boy. All right, we're on day two of siding. The guys are hard at work putting some more courses up. I'm over on the back side trying to stay ahead of them, finishing up some mechanical blockouts, figuring out some more trim and water management details. I still have to bend all the head flashings for the windows and doors back there. So that's what I'm going to be working on this morning. And hopefully these guys can get through this whole wall by the end of the day. We'll see. It's a pretty big wall. But now that we're above the garage door and some of those lighting blocks out there, it should go pretty quick. I just wanted to give a brief example of how much thought has to go into some of this stuff to make it both look and perform well. This is a little PVC frame that I made for our ERV fresh air intake, which is this guy right here. So that's gonna sit in there. But the hard part here is, I mean, this is a pretty big piece of metal. It's a six inch duct, six inch hole that I gotta cut in the wall. So I only wanna do it once and I wanna make sure it's in the right spot. And I gotta make sure that it looks good not only out here and that I can manage the water management details, but that it looks good on the inside too, on my mechanical room, which is right on the other side of this wall. So that frame sits somewhere right about there and that duct I think is gonna have to come. I'm gonna move that power box and it's gonna come right between those two pipes right there. And luckily I have my ERV here. So I was able to just open it up and check out where the inlets are. So according to the manual, that is the fresh air inlet that I'm trying to connect to. This whole box here is gonna be mounted up on the wall. So I'm thinking I come through there, I can 90 up, 90 over and 90 down, and that'll look pretty nice. My other alternative was to come through my existing long block that's already here and do something like right here coming up, but then I would have to come up and around this well tank. And again, I just didn't think that was as clean. I feel like in a lot of production built homes or even custom homes that don't have like really, really tight management or a really good GC, these kind of conflicts come up all the time where maybe the HVAC guy has to come in later and drill something that's already been sided and the, then the flashing detail is not proper. There's just so many like integrated little pieces of trades that have, that have to fit together in order for it to come out looking and performing well. This is why I think I actually burn more calories thinking about this stuff than actually executing and doing it. Planning it out is the hardest part. This could be interesting. This is by far the largest hole saw I've ever used. Six inch diameter. This is for our ERV intake duct. Traditionally, you'd want like a, like a whole hog, like a big right angle drill for this. Don't have that. This little drill battery was not having that. This drill bit is a monster. <laughs> this drill wants to break my arm off. One last push. This drill's about to start smoking. Oh gosh, we lost our pilot bit. Oh, we got her. Holy smokes, that's a big hole. <laughs> Can basically pull out the donut of this at a time. My drill won't reach in all the way, but I'm gonna go and try to mark a little drill mark. Here's that pilot hole here, and it's pretty much just how I planned. It's gonna land right in the middle of my hot and cold water pipes. That is fantastic. There she is. It's a big old hole in the wall.
I'm finally done with all of the mechanical penetrations on the back of this wall. Luckily, most of the small ones were pre-made blocks that already have flashing integrated. I don't have to deal with them as far as making a little PVC surround and making head flashing, but some of them I do. So that's the next step. The guys are still finishing up the gable end siding. So I'm gonna try to stay ahead of them and bend these flashings up. Not only do I have to do flashings for the mechanical penetrations, but I also have to do the windows and doors. So I'm just going to batch cut them. I took a bunch of measurements, have them all listed out, and I should be able to knock it out fairly quickly. I'm gonna roll my trim coil to approximate length here. And while Ben's truck is here with the brake that has the slitter mounted on it, that will make ripping this down into strips much, much easier. This is two foot wide trim coil, so I should be able to get quite a bit out of this. This is a lot more than I need to finish the whole rest of the project, so I'm happy about that. Pro tip, don't try to use a pen on sheet metal. Spoiler is it doesn't really work that well. What I'm doing right here is the reason that I'm doing all this before Ben leaves because that coil cutter, that slitter tool is an absolute lifesaver. I wish it weren't $500, <laughs> I'd buy one myself, but this is really one of the only projects I need it for in the near future. Someday I'm sure I'll get one. I'm gonna cut this into four six inch strips. Here's the slitter, we'll see how this works in a second. This tool glides along the brake and then these two closely spaced rollers ride right through the material and just shear it right along this line. It cuts an inch and a half off the nose of the brake here, so you just have to compensate that. Here's my cut line. But check this thing out versus snips. That's just incredible. 10 times quicker than shears at least. That's the end of day 1.5. The guys were able to get most of the way up this first wall here. These angle cuts kind of slow things down, but I think in the morning we'll be able to hit it pretty good. Everything's looking great so far. I'm really excited to get all the trim on and get it complete. We're just gonna put the trim on as the last step, the window trim, and put it on as we're going down. We'll do a little clean and a little paint touch up on any areas that might need it on the way down as well as a last step. Then, time to move on to the back side. That's getting all hardy as well. The guys are working on the top freeze board now. It's just a piece of one by six PVC trim. It goes on top of our furring strip and meets up at the top. The trickiest part was that top angle. You can see it's not a plumb line. To get the faces of the cuts the same with two different roof pitches, that angle had to be kind of a compound on each one. I can catch it if you're coming, if you need leverage. Because this liquor max obscures the nail holes in the sheathing, the first step after rolling it out is to mark the nail lines back with a sharpie. We're underway on day three. Finished the top of this wall this morning and holy smokes, does this look good. Look at that window trim. That is fantastic looking. Looks amazing. We got our one by six freeze board across the top. I originally planned on doing a one by four there, uh, but when we actually mocked it up, you could still see the cut edges of the siding if you were like right up underneath of it. So ended up with one by six there, a little bit more money, but worth it to not have to see ugly siding edges. Overall, this side looks amazing. I got up there on the pump jacks with Ben, and as we were coming down, we did any little bits of touch up paint that was needed, wiped everything down. The Hardy is a fantastic product once installed, but I will say it is quite delicate while you're installing it. Very easy to chip, very easy to mar the paint finish. I can see why a lot of builders install this in the primed condition and then they have a painter come back through and paint everything after everything's all installed and done to protect the finish. But we had the Hardy touch-up kit and that helped a good bit. It was quite a bit of labor to do this. I mean, Ben and Mike took, I, mean, I guess you could total it out to two days to do this one wall, but I think it was really worth it. Loved how it turned out. That's a wrap on day three. The guys had a hat a little bit early today, but we still got a few courses of siding on the backup. Got the pump jack set up back here now. Should be able to rock and roll in the morning. First side looks so good. I'm really happy with it. 
Window trims, all the details turned out fantastic. Just have to get that garage door trim and the corner trims on and that side will be totally done as far as siding goes. Pretty much all the mechanical and electrical blocks for this house are on this back side. So that's gonna slow things down a little bit to finish this, but hopefully we can finish the siding tomorrow maybe get the trims up, and then it's gonna be on to the dormers out front. That's gonna be getting PVC sheet, board and batten. We'll still be using the Slicker Max rain screen underneath, but just a slightly different assembly on the finishes. One of the most critical aspects of installing this siding is painting any cut edges in the field. James Hardy provides touch-up kits for this. I'll link the one we used above in the corner. Best practice is to leave only the factory edges exposed where you can see them and put all the cut edges underneath either the corner or the door or window trim. This is exactly what we did for our installation. The touch-up kit also includes a dauber to cover nail heads that'll be exposed. These won't really be exposed. I'm gonna be putting a piece of one x four PVC over top that small strip beneath the deck ledger to cover this area, but we coated them just in case. That's the end of day four. The guys got almost to the top of the wall at the end there. I was helping them paint the edges just to try to make things go a little bit quicker to get to the top, but we didn't quite get there. That's okay, they had to go work on another job that is high priority for a couple weeks. I'm gonna try to finish this up. Ben was kind enough to leave his pump jack set up so I can use that and that is really one of the main tools that's needed for this lap siding job so I'm grateful for that. Then I'm probably gonna move on to the board and batten out front and then finish with the vinyl on the south side. Ben and Michael have been doing a great job keeping nice clean straight cuts, keeping the courses level, even reveals and it's looking like a really solid install. Tomorrow I'm meeting with a stonemason to go over the stone veneer portion that is going to wrap three quarters of the house. It's about 300 square feet of stone veneer. I'm gonna try to do all the prep work myself to save money on the mason's end. It's another one of those trades that I never really even thought about DIYing. It takes a lot of skill experience to know how the stone goes on and looks best, especially because we're using mosaic stone. It's all angular. It's gonna take quite a bit of field cutting to make it look good. But it's time to get some rest for today and tomorrow we'll get back at it. Coming live from the scaffold, I somehow talked to Landon in getting up here. I can't believe it. We're standing, you know, 20 plus feet off the ground, I would say. But we're getting our flashings in, so we nailed our metal flashing in above the door and windows. Lena's taping it to the wall now. Once these are on, we've just put a little strip of rain screen above it to keep the wall the same width. Then, like you see at the end there with that piece of wood, we're going to be uh, putting that five quarter deck board all the way across the top. That's painted on the bottom edge, so when you look up, you see white and that will provide a mounting surface for our one by six piece of PVC trim that's going to come just like this, cover the top edge of our siding and the nails that will be exposed there. It's gonna look awesome. I am stoked to see it when it's finally done. I'll give her credit, there are not many women that would come up here and do what we're doing. So I gotta give props to Miss Elena for joining me up on the walk plank. Just to give you an idea of what we're doing here with the trim, we got our flashing on, of course, and this is like a little mock-up cross section. We'll tuck right up under there, and it's gonna sit right up over our top of our door. On the windows, we don't have that ledge to sit on top of, so this is gonna just sit right up under here. We built the window trim so that there's going to be a half inch of overlap over top the front of the window face so that there's no gaps exposed. And we really don't need to seal it either because of how we did our trim detail, which is really nice. No exterior caulk around the windows or anything that's going to be long-term maintenance. Roll the Ro tape. Roll that tape, girl. Roll, <laughs> Roll it. Roll the tape. Somehow I got some air bubbles in there. That's okay. <laughs> While Lena's working on that, I'm wrapping up these last few pieces of siding. The guys did get a little bit off kilter on the left side of this door, so we had to take a few off to make sure that we lined up once we got over top of the doors and windows. 
not really a big deal. Just took a couple hours this morning and did that. But now we're back on track. So I'm just cutting around this electric box. Anytime we're meeting an obstacle for siding, I'm basically measuring over from the edge of where the siding should be, marking where my two side cuts are gonna be. And then I also made a little mark where the seven inch exposure is. So that's where the bottom edge of the next side course will sit. I'm measuring from there to a quarter inch above this where the siding needs to have enough clearance. And that is the amount of material that I'll remove from the next course in between my side measurements. Here's a little sketch of that just to make it clear. So yeah, there's my two side measurements there. This bottom piece I removed two and a quarter and the top I haven't measured just yet, but same idea there. He is on high alert after the gunshot sound. <laughs> Look at him. He's like, what is going on? Moving right along here, Elena's got the Slicker Max above this door now. Next step for her is to get that wood strip up here. That's her next project. I'm working on figuring out how we're gonna do this at the top of the wall here with the siding. And actually, by some crazy coincidence, it's gonna work out really well. So the bottom of this next course goes here and the top of that piece ends up here but then there's the, the inch and a quarter overlap. So the bottom of this very last piece of siding here just happens to be the perfect exposure over top of this window trim. A quarter inch is the minimum gap there and it's just a little over that. So I'll be able to rip a simple inch and a quarter starter strip just like we were starting the base of a wall and putting it right over here. The bottom of that next course will run right over top of that starter strip and it's going to just coincidentally work out great over the windows. The door doesn't come quite as high as the windows, so this will be a notch out of this piece of siding. I'll still put a starter strip. Well, will I put a starter strip there? I can't, I'll have to figure that one out, but I may or may not put a starter strip there. That piece will be notched out. We'll have it seam somewhere behind the door and we'll keep moving down the wall. Oh, she's doing the siding dance. Let go. Oh, oh she's shaking the jacks, shaking the scaffold, shaking the scaffold. My shoe's untied. Probably not good for this part of the scaffold that has no railing. Okay. Whoa! Just kidding. You don't even joke though. <laughs> you sure it's not going to keep scratching? Okay, excellent. That looks good. That's a sweet looking joint right there. They say these should be installed in moderate contact. Not too crazy tight, but not a quarter inch gap either. This little scaffold extension is certainly not OSHA approved, but it does get the job done with a little bit of extra carefulness. Check out this neat little artifact that I found underneath of the protective paper. This must've happened literally at the factory. A bee or some sort of insect snuck in here and got completely smushed. And I thought it would be a good idea to make a starter strip out of it. So this little guy's sticking with the house forever. To fasten these starter strips above the windows, I'm using my 16 gauge trim gun with some galvanized nails because there is no other way you can nail through this without splitting it. You can pre-drill, I guess, and hand nail it, but that's a lot more time and effort. So this happens to work quite well. I just make sure I stay like at least two or three inches from the edges because it will break them off. Before we cover this up completely with siding, let's talk about the top of wall detail we got going on here for the slicker. We've got our top furring strip here, which our freeze board, our one by six freeze board will attach to, and we're holding the slicker back about a half inch or so from that. And the top of the hardy, we're also holding back a little bit. So our top strip here, there's, there's probably close to a half inch, maybe seven sixteenths or something there. That airspace should allow any moisture or air traveling up the channels to have a place to escape. Up and out, it will have to come down underneath the freeze board, which will overlap all this and hide the, the top of our siding here. But I thought that would be a good idea just to have that little bit of airspace in there. Definitely not OSHA approved, this scaffolding setup, but we're getting there. Makes me feel a lot better when I get rid of the ladder. My ladder's up against the piece of siding that the gecko gauge is supposed to slide under. Luckily I have a mark on the window line here where this should be. I'm just gonna put one nail in there and then I'll level her out. There I go. The last full piece. Now I should be able to get the gecko gauges in and put 
last little skinny bit up here. I feel like a rock climber up here, to be honest. I'm like gripping on to this little ledge on the window <laughs> until I get back to this blue support on the scaffolding. That's my next handhold. In a perfect world, there'd be a third pump jack there with another walk board, another ladder rail set up, but this is not a perfect world. And I'm lucky enough that Ben was able to leave this here and let me use it. Crap, I need to put my little metal flash card in. I almost forgot. Not that it really matters all that much up here, but it's the last one. Might as well do it right. And that is the very last nail on this back wall. Heck yeah. Now to mount the, all the trims. 